Hey guys, I think we're live. Are we live? I've got this chat open, so I'll know in a moment if you guys can hear me. Um, welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. We're doing one of these rare lives. We're going to try to do more of them in the future. This is going to be a really special live because we have a very special guest in studio today, Trent Horn, who I'll introduce in a moment. Some of you guys know about his amazing work. But first of all, I just wanted to thank everybody again for tuning in. We're getting started here. We're going to do some live Q&A during this uh, live stream. We're also going to do a quick debrief on the Whatever podcast um, conversation that I had yesterday with Trent Horn. It was a debate on is sex work bad for society? We're going to talk about that. We're also going to learn more about Trent Horn. So you've heard Trent Horn before in the podcast, if you remember the episode with his lovely wife, Laura, who I'm a big fan of. Check out her YouTube channel, too. She does very funny kind of niche Catholic comedy, but if it's, it's, it's inside baseball, but it's hilarious. So you can check her, her um, channel out. Trent has an amazing channel, which is the Council of Trent. And he does amazing Catholic apology. He talks about uh, a lot of theology issues. He talks about a lot of cultural issues. And he's an amazing debater and author. So he's a staff apologist for Catholic Answers. So he's here in studio. Trent, thanks so much for joining. So good to be here. After we uh, you know, had a bit of a long day and evening uh, yesterday with the debate on whatever. But yeah, it's, it's, fun to be, it's fun to be in this situation. And it's a lot more relaxed. We can just kind of chat. Yeah, well, and we have a chat here, yeah. which is very um, kind. I think a lot kinder than the um, <laughs> the whatever chat at points you get roasted. But um, massive Lila and Trent win. I saw a lot of people commenting about what an excellent debater you are, Trent, which I fully second. Um, you are you are fantastic. Um, well, you. let's let's start. I do want to get into the whatever podcast. Sure. We will do that. Yeah. Um, that was a three hour debate we had yesterday. Yeah, but I want to start with. Um, just people learning more about you. You sure. obviously have your channel, Council of Trent, but why did you get into, what got you interested in and why did you get into doing apologetics? Sure. Uh, so I'm a convert to the Catholic faith. I grew up in a kind of a non-religious home. My dad was Jewish, but he, he didn't go to temple. And my mom was a former ex-Catholic, but she didn't really go to church. She was Christian. And we didn't go to church as kids. Uh, so I grew up kind of being a deist. I believe there was a God out there, but I didn't subscribe to any religion. I, I thought Christianity was false. And when I did more research in high school, I realized it was just a certain form of Christianity that I thought it was wrong, kind of Protestant fundamentalism. I was really attracted to the teachings of Catholicism, and I uh, was exposed to them through a Catholic youth group in my high school. So then I came to accept uh, that uh, Christianity is true, Jesus rose from the dead, and then in my investigations that the Catholic Church <laughs> is the church that Jesus Christ established. Uh, so in doing all of that, like I have my objections, my concerns, I need evidence. So I have to, a lot of people who are apologists who give defenses of the Catholic faith, a fair number of them are converts because they had to kind of convince themselves first. They had to go through all these arguments mm -hmm. themselves. And after I went through all of that, I you know volunteered for the same youth group that helped me. I was doing pro-life work because I got convicted about that. And people said, oh, you have a good ability to teach this to people and to rebut things and answer objections. And so I just wanted to be a service to others because you know this had helped me. I wanted to help other people. And, and I, I enjoy it. I enjoy research. I enjoy debate. I was never like a formal debater or anything like that. But um, it's just the temperament I have. I enjoy this kind of um, engagement with people. And I just enjoy helping to remove obstacles to, to the truth that can form in people, intellectual obstacles that can be in people's paths to faith in Christ. So you and I both, um, we have, we love obviously, and have some background. I was raised evangelical Protestant, and I have a lot of listeners on the channel who are evangelical or Protestant. Some people don't even ascribe that way. Maybe they're Orthodox or certainly a lot of Catholics. Yeah. Um, you made this comment, you said, I I saw a lot of inconsistencies or you, you, you were looking at, you called it, I think fundamentalism. Yeah. Fundamentalist Protestantism is, is maybe the term you used. Yeah. Well, I remember when I was in junior high, so this would have been back in the late nineties, uh, the 20th century, as some people would call it now. <laughs> uh, I love there's like, the a, 90s. So, somebody shares something on social media saying, do, professor, do you care if I use an older source from the late 20th century? 
And he's just like, you know, like sighing, like, oh, am I that old? Uh, but yeah, I remember I would go on the internet back then and I was investigating religion. So is this a would... Protestant youth group? No. So no? the youth group came later. Like in junior okay. high, I was just like, there's a God, but whatever. He doesn't what care What faith about did me. your parents have? They weren't really practicing anything. They didn't okay. practice anything. So I was just choose your own, choose your own adventure. And I would go on the internet, I would debate Christians who said that, you know, evolution is false and mm. it endorsed young earth creationism. And I had read a lot of, there was a lot of debate on the internet back then between creationists, young earth creationists and evolu people who defend evolution. There was an evolution. internet in the 90s? <laughs> yeah, it just ran a lot slower. When you turned it on, it sounded like a dying cat. I remember I'd turn it on or you would clog up the phone line. My mom would be like, you got to get off the internet. I got to use the phone because it all used the phone so line. So you would be doing internet research in the 90s. That That oh, is yeah. a true... 98, That 99. is a true it apologist was, in, it, in, in waiting it was, right there. But, but yeah, and I remember back then, this is before YouTube, a lot of the debates I listened to were in audio debates. They were not video because it was audio recorded at a college or when a debate happened. And so I was debating, then I thought Christians... I thought Christians used faith as a crutch and they're very anti-science. Mm -hmm. Like I loved science. So like when I was in the sixth grade, I joined the Young Astronomers Club and I got we got to go to Jet Propulsion Laboratory and I thought in JPL here in Pasadena. And I thought this is the coolest thing ever. And I just thought science is awesome. And why do I need religion? It seems like religious people just scoff at science or they're anti-scientific. But then later seeing within Catholicism, oh, you have uh, Monsignor Georges Lemaitre, a Catholic priest, who was the, who developed what later became to be known as the Big Bang Theory? Mm -hmm. Gregor Mendel, an Augustinian monk, who was the father of modern genetics. Like seeing within Catholicism, especially for me, that faith and reasons, uh, science and faith, really intertwine well. I found that very attractive. And then, of course, there's also there's Protestantism, of course, that that would be similar there as well. Not all Protestants are young Earth creationists. There are Catholics who are young Earth creationists, which is fine. The Church says. The church doesn't make scientific judgments. The church says you have to believe that God created the world and he made man in his image. How he did it, Catholics are free to accept scientific consensus on that <laughs> or not. That's fine. But what then what attracted me beyond just the scientific evidence was seeing, oh, Jesus didn't leave us a book. Jesus didn't tell anyone to write anything down. Uh, prior to his ascension, he didn't tell anyone to write anything down. The apostles don't talk about a collection of writings being a sole infallible rule of faith that just Catholicism made more sense of the data I saw from scripture and history. And then, and, the, and then, but that was the impetus for that was being invited. Just this nice girl who was a friend of mine invited me to the Catholic youth group. Hmm. And it's like, okay, I'll give it a try. And they, they liked, they would take questions and they were willing to dialogue. They weren't standoffish. And, you know, I appreciated that. So how old were you when you became Catholic? Uh, it was 2002. So I would have been 17. Okay. So the process started probably like a year earlier. And then what was the process like from 17 to now you're a staff apologist at Catholic Answers? Yeah, so... Your whole the, life is doing In the latter Catholic part of theology. high school, let's see, I was, I remember that I, oh, I, I was invited, this girl, not Laura, but she's a very nice girl, she's married now, uh, invited me to go to prom with her because she went to a very tiny Catholic school that had like 25 people at it. So they wanted to have a prom. So oh, wow. <laughs> they they decided they were all going to invite somebody who didn't go to the school, each person. So yeah, you know, how so, do you do a prom with 25? Well, if you each Is that the whole class the size? Whole, yeah, it's a very tiny Catholic school. Okay, so all school. four classes yes. equal 25 people. I, I went to one of their senior graduations. It was one person, but he was like valedictorian. Sounds like homeschool. Home, home, <laughs> like... It, it does feel that. Oh, totally. <laughs> but uh, so they all just said, oh, we'll all invite people who don't go to the school. So now you have 50. And so she invited me. And I met her dad, and he was the president of the State Right to Life organization. And he showed me his pro-life work. And I was just really convicted at that point. Like, wow, this is – and I, I, and then I got really going down the rabbit hole of the arguments that people mm -hmm. make for and against. Because I was nominally pro-life, but not – wasn't as big a deal to me. I read Francis Beckwith's book, Politically Correct Death, mm -hmm. uh, which he's now – he'd reworked as Defending Life. Uh, but Frank is one of the best pro-life um, philosophers mm -hmm. out there. Uh, along with Chris Kazor and Patrick Lee, uh, Chris Tollefson. If you guys are watching, I'm not playing favorites or anything. Mm -hmm. I'm not playing favorites, guys. You're all great. Uh, but I remember reading that and just being really addicted to these arguments are so fascinating. And, you know, debating people on that. I was involved in the pro-life club at Arizona State when I went there. 
And then when I graduated college, I decided to, oh, in my last years of college, a pro-life organization called Justice for All came to our school and set up these big images with, with abortion on them. And I just was late to class because I just wanted, I just started dialoguing. They had an open mic and I was debating people on abortion and people are like, how can you work with these people and, and do this? I'm like, I don't work with these people. I go to school here. I just think they're right. And then I started joining them on trips and I raised funds to go work for them. And so I worked for them for several years. Then I worked for the Diocese of Phoenix as the Respect Life Coordinator. And I was offered a position there. And I, I, I left Justice for All and I, I eventually got to the diocese because I was dating Laura. We were engaged and we were going to get married. And I got to find some you know stable employment. And then six months before we got married, I was leading people on this uh trip to California to go to a marriage conference and do pro-life outreach. And I took a tour of Catholic Answers and someone called me who had inside knowledge saying, hey, they want to hire a new apologist. Mm -hmm. And I had been creating my own materials. I had video of me doing those debates on college campuses. And I went to them and said, hey, I'm, I'm interested. Here's my materials I've made. Here's the debates I did on college campuses. And I would debate people on abortion or atheism just live, live in person with a microphone and you go. And a lot of my like, debate practice is not, you don't go to a class to learn this, you just get out there and you just, you know, you, you just kind of go through and engage people and learn what works. And then they they brought me on, that was December of 2012. So I've been with them now for you know, over about 10 years. Awesome. Yeah. And you've written how many books in that time? Books are kind of like kids, like after like seven, you're like, how many? How many are you at? Uh, I am, I think like nine. Way to go, Trent. That's yeah. awesome. So um, I got another one coming out in spring, and I'm, I enjoy writing a lot. Writing was something that I really enjoyed when I was younger. Uh, I have actually terrible handwriting. It's, it's just absolutely illegible. But when I can start writing, I remember when I was a kid, writing for me is like the only art that I can really do. Hmm. Like when I was a kid, I tried to draw in like the third grade and my art teacher like berated me for how terrible it was. And I think it like broke my spirit. Like I, I, I literally said they cannot draw and I can't write well. My hands don't. Because of the third grade teacher? I was still always bad. It's not okay. her fault. She just <laughs> recognized how bad I was. And that's fair. But when I sit down at a, at a keyboard and I can just put words together, like I can draw something with, mm -hmm. with words and pull ideas together. And so I really enjoy writing. And my writing style is so funny. Some people start at the beginning, go to the end, or methodical. I, th I throw stuff around, throw stuff around, around. I'll start at the middle, I'll go to the end. I usually write the introduction of a book at, at the end. Um, that makes sense, though. Once yeah, oh, yeah. Or the book like, kind of writes itself to some degree once you're... Yeah. Putting it all, putting it all in there. But nine is nine is a lot. You can see, yeah. you can tell that you obviously like to think and like to. Uh, explore different topics, but yeah. that you also like to write in uh, order and, to get nine books. And nine with writing, books I like research. I remember mm -hmm. when somebody asked me to endorse their book on a subject, and it was an apologetic book, but I actually declined because their apologetic book had no footnotes in it. And I was like, if you're doing, that's fine for like a testimony. That's rough, yeah. For like a testimony <laughs> that, or a memoir, that's fine, but you're not doing any research. Like, And that's one of my favorite things in my books is to put all of that mm -hmm. research just in the show, hey, this is true, we can back it up, and like focus on. Well, that I will say, let's talk about, we're getting a lot of comments in the chat, so I wanna pay attention Go to right our ahead, chat. Yeah. I'm, I'm learning the YouTube live thing, and I appreciate everyone engaging, um, it's awesome. So lots of people um, are excited to ask questions here. Yeah. Okay, lots of good ones about the debate and other things. So we'll start We'll start with whatever. Let's talk about whatever now. We just did that yesterday. That was, for each of us, that was our round two. For each of us, that was our round two on whatever and round two with Destiny. Yeah, it was. I, I um, it, it, That's true. And you, you had done a great job with your debate with Destiny months back on abortion. Um, I also had an abortion debate. There were some mixed issues, but you did a fantastic job. Very well done. Um, but let's 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 get a question in here. So, well, there's first a question asking which what you want to share. What prompted the debate? Yes. I hadn't heard this was happening until Trent's post on YouTube announcing the debate. Yes. So, I was perusing the internet and I saw uh, a debate between Jasmine, who was one of the mm -hmm. participants in our in our discussion, with a, a, a Christian YouTuber. Uh, and they, they were having a discussion uh, about, it wasn't about OnlyFans or sex work, it was about another topic. But I thought that she was uh, 
you know, not like, you know how sometimes there's the girls will be out there defending this stuff and they're kind of like ditzy or they're not well, well thought out, but, but she seemed to have cogent points and was able to put together, put together an argument. And when I researched her more, I saw that, you know, she, um, she's a lawyer and she can, she can make arguments. She's not just like spouting off stuff. So, oh, this is interesting. And so I emailed her and I said, Hey, I've been looking to have a dialogue with someone on whether pornography or prostitution is okay. Would you like to come on my channel mm -hmm. and we'll just dialogue about it? And I thought, okay, well, what's a way I could use this? Because I'm, I'm always thinking like, how can I reach the most people and especially the most non-Catholic people? Mm -hmm. And I want to share the truth. I want to get in front of them and present, here's the truth and here are good reasons to accept it. And what would be a good way to do that? And I thought, oh, it might be, this might be a way to get back on the Whatever podcast to present that to people. And uh, Brian seemed to really enjoy the debate that you know I had with Destiny before. I thought, well, what if I pulled people together? I thought, well, it could be me and Jasmine, but if you have more people, it ups the ante and gets people more excited to want this to happen. And so Destiny came into the fold. But I knew with Jasmine there, I really wanted a solid, virtuous woman who is intelligent and then Laura said she was busy, so I went with her. I'm just kidding. No, Laura, Laura. I'll take second to Lauren. That's fine. <laughs> no, I said, I actually asked Laura. That like, would have been I, great, actually, if Laura had done that. That well, would have been very fun. <laughs> Laura is funny. I, I asked her, and she said, like, she would love to do it, but also she'd be just, like, too nervous. Like, oh, what if I don't say the, the right thing? Or, like, no, you just go out there, you get them. I'm going to. But she's, uh, I remember one thing that really attracted me to Laura, though was during the Justice for All time when I did the pro-life work on college campuses. That's where we met. Mm -hmm. And I saw her on campus. Like, she would debate professors. And, you know, this little blonde girl It's like, well, why would you do that? And she just, like, so she's got that, that spirit as well. But she was like, By the way, know. if you want to hear Trent and Laura's love story, it's very cute and very fun. We have an episode on that from several months back. So you can check that out on the podcast. Yeah. I don't remember the episode number, but yeah, yeah, that so, was, it was very fun. So, but I thought, I thought you'd be a great, great pick to Thank have. You, and honestly, like I saw people in the comments saying that like, even just like a comparison of the demeanor and rapport mm -hmm. and how you and Jasmine carried yourselves, it just shows such a stark difference in your worldviews and how you consider sexuality and how to value and cherish this. And, and so I knew that, that I wanted people to especially be able to see, because this is an issue involving men and women, to see how men and women can present themselves in this you know, kind of virtuous way. Yes. Well, I thought it was great and I, that you kind of initiated it. And I mean, you and I both know pornography is everywhere. Yes. And there's so, so much more sort of social, a push to accept socially things like OnlyFans, things yeah. like, you know, por just pornography and sex work, as they call it, or prostitution. Yeah. So I thought it was great. Um, some more questions. OK, so uh, this is a this is a good one. This is kind of the debrief question, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, so. Of course, this is from Timothy O'Donnell. Of course, nobody's perfect during a debate. What would Trent like to have phrased differently during the debate? Yeah, and I sure. can tell all things I would have done differently. Trent was nearly perfect. Trent did really, really well. So yeah, what do you think, Trent? What's your debate? I know there's just little things. Uh, I remember when I was talking about um, uh, prostitutes and being murdered in Germany versus uh, mm. Sweden and Destiny brought up all their population differences, and my brain just ran dry about the populations of Germany and Sweden. Google it right now. Let's see. I didn't want to say because I wasn't sure if I was going to be right. I want to yeah. say Germany. I want to say Germany's. I don't know. Sweden. I think is five million. Germany might only be like ten or twenty million. I think it's. I think it's like fifty or sixty. I think that's what. Yeah. See, that's why I wasn't sure. So yeah, I didn't want to say. I, I can look it up. But yeah. That's so, tough. But, but when even with the population, thing. eighty-three million Germany. Yeah. It's a big country. But, but even with the differences there, my point is that when you examine the two different countries, yeah. how they treat prostitution, Sweden has dramatically reduced the demand for it mm -hmm. by criminalizing buying prostitution. Mm -hmm. Even uh, traffickers, police have intercepted their communications saying that it's a bad market for sex and for other elements like that. But, you know, I, I mean, that was one off the top of my head just, but I think I, I still talked about that really to the study. Uh, I don't know. There were just other little elements here or there where maybe like I wanted to, you know, find something and I couldn't find it or had to wait and collect my thoughts of it. But I, I can't really think of anything where they brought up an argument for a position that 
I, I or you wasn't just un was unable to to answer. I I really wanted to keep focusing them back on the basic moral and value question of just is this stuff bad? What does it do to people? And what does the moral philosophy that justifies pornography and sex and prostitution? What does it also justify? What does it naturally lead to. It takes away any principled objection towards, mm -hmm. which is why I pushed to say this leads to accepting extremely depraved things. And I think it's important for people to see that if this is the worldview you want to endorse, this is what you're going to have to buy later. Maybe you don't want to buy that. So I think that's I a great point. And I think that was clear in that both Destiny and Jasmine effectively had to say, yes, incest is okay, provided there's consent. And yeah. even on the bestiality question, when they were pressed, it seemed that they kind of like, yeah. I Jasmine mean... didn't want to, but De Destiny realized that the argument mm -hmm. um, doesn't work there. I have an episode mm -hmm. coming out soon just on that, mm -hmm. on the, the article Peter Singer shared, because this is not, like I said, it's not just a fringe thing. Like he's a famous philosopher sharing this article. And a lot of people have, the problem is a lot of people say, oh, it's obvious that it's wrong. Well, why is it wrong? We always want to say like, give me the reason that something is wrong. And then you have to follow those reasons like, oh, well, it's just obvious infanticide is wrong. Well, why is infanticide wrong? If infanticide is wrong, why is it wrong to commit infanticide but not kill an intelligent pig to have pork chops? Pigs are smart. They, I mean, they can solve puzzles even, but pigs are also delicious. And I have no qualms about eating pigs, but why is it wrong? Well, like why is infanticide so awful, but pigicide just is not? Well, because infants are human beings, and there's, oh, so that's your reason. Oh, well, who else is a human being we're killing all the time? You know, so they're biological human beings. So it's similar. It's a similar way to run backwards if you're talking about sexual ethics. We do this in pro-life all the time. Mm -hmm. Hey, see this horrible view? That's what pro-choice leads to. If you don't want to go there, maybe you should take the other view. Similar with sexual ethics. Hey, see this depraved and wicked sexual act? Your worldview leads to that. If you don't want to go there, because in that article I'm, I critique that defended bestiality, it said, if you make an argument that sex is ordered towards a particular purpose, like human procreation, then you have a solid argument against bestiality. I was like, oh, that's pretty. And I point that out in the episode coming up soon. Like the author admits, yeah, if that's your defense, we've well, got a way around it. But if you do that, well, then other kinds of sexual behaviors among human beings, you'll see they're disordered. So. I was impressed with, well, I was impressed with a few things about your uh, performance, let's call it at the debate. But mm -hmm. one is before the debate, the amount of prep that I know you put into that. I mean, you're, yeah. you take this, this is not um, just something that you do. This is a, something you take extremely seriously yeah. because I know you care deeply about souls and reaching yeah. people. And so, you know, you and I were going back and forth, but you really put in a tremendous amount of time into um, making sure you understood the the body of research around yes. uh, the harm of pornography, the harm of prostitution on both the creators and the users. Yeah. And I was impressed during the debate that multiple times, you know, I had some papers and I was like looking, but you were just, you knew the study. You yeah. knew it in the top of your mind and you, you remembered it. You had memorized it. Um, yeah. I am curious and I've had, um, you know, people... I think are curious in general about how you prepare yeah, for sure. debate. Like, what is the process that you go through, and also for your channel, because yeah. you and I were talking about this in the yeah, car ride sure. back last night. That's but fine. you do you do uh, put a lot of prep yes. into your videos, yeah. and you're very careful with uh, the arguments that you include. So, what's your process? Yeah, so the videos now, the episodes. I started this like eight months ago. I, I script them, mm -hmm. and I'm happy to tell people that. I mean, I use a teleprompter and I script them. But I mean, I'm more than capable of having a discussion without a teleprompter. Of course. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a slave to one. But I do that for my episodes. I script them out because I like writing, number one. And two, I just want to be really judicious with people's time. Like there's so much content out there. People are so busy. I want to give them the information as efficiently as possible. Mm -hmm. So when you speak off the top of your head, you're always going to be inefficient. That's just, that's just how it goes. Something I script that's 20 minutes long, if I tried to cover all the same material, it would take me 40 minutes and I'd have a bunch of extra stuff that doesn't need to be there. So I like the, pre the prep for that. For debates, it was funny. I was once at the University of uh, university of Minnesota. I was debating Dan Barker, an atheist. It was our second debate. This was on uh, does the Christian God exist, all right? Mm -hmm. And so I, before the debate, I was at the Newman Center. I went to Mass and I met some of the people there and the football players for the college were there. 
and we were talking about what we do and like, how oh, you do debates. It's awesome. I said, yeah. They're like, how do you prepare? I said, well, you guys, like before you have a big game, like, do you watch footage of the other team before you do the game? And they said, yeah, we always do that. Like a lot of athletes will watch footage of someone they're going to play against to see what do they do? And you know, do they have little tells? Do they have a particular kind of play that they like to use? And so you, that way you're, you know, oh, this is going to happen. So I'm prepared for it. And I said to him, I do the same thing. Like prior to that debate, I had watched four or five of the most recent debates Barker had done on this subject. And Dan has been doing debates for since I, before I was born, I think. He's been doing this for a long time. But his debates have become very predictable. So when we got up for the, the – <laughs> when we got up for our debate, Does the Christian God Exist?, Dan used a tactic that is called the Gish Gallop. All right. Have you ever heard of that? Term? I have heard of that. Yeah. Gish galloping. Yes. So the term a comes... common accusation of a if you're upset at your, your the way your partner debates. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the term comes from Dwayne Gish. So he was mm -hmm. a Protestant who would argue for cre young Earth creationism, and what Gish would do when he would debate someone defending evolution, he would say, "Here's 25 problems with evolution." And then the other guy doesn't have time to solve all 25 problems and explain. It's easier to make a mess than to clean up a mess, right? It takes more mm -hmm. time to clean something up than it is to just make a mess. And then he would say, look, he didn't answer this. He didn't answer that. Well, you threw so much stuff at him. How's he supposed to do that? It's a filibuster. It's a little bit like act. a filibuster. Like a filibuster would be just taking up as much time so that mm -hmm. you don't have to say stuff. But it's more like throwing so much mm -hmm. at him. They can't possibly answer it all. So that's the Gish Gallop. And Barker did a Gish Gallop with me. Mm. He just said, here's the, the Christian God doesn't exist because of this Bible passage, this Bible passage. This, you know, this is embarrassing. This is violent. And threw it all out there. But I was prepared. I basically had reconstructed in my mind, all right, before the debate, I had constructed what his opening statement would probably be. So my rebuttal, I scripted out my entire rebuttal to answer him point by point as efficiently as possible. So now the Gish Gallop, I could run in reverse. I had a bunch of answers I could throw back at him, and he doesn't have time to answer them all. So that's the so the Gish Gallop, you're in real trouble if you've got a skilled person that can throw them all back. So that's what, but the only way I was able to do that was I knew what he was going to say. I had a pre-written rebuttal. Now, I don't always have pre-written rebuttals, but a lot of times when I'll engage people, like for this debate, mm -hmm. Like, I thought to myself, okay, what would Jasmine say? What has she said in her YouTube channel? What has Destiny said? If I'm, and sometimes I'll try to get in the head of that person, like, I'm going to make this argument, but if I were Destiny, what would I say to that? Oh, okay. I would say that if I were Destiny. Then I need to say this. Well, what would Destiny say to that? And so I said before the show when we were talking, it's also similar to if you play chess. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you want to be good at apologetics or debate or do things like that, I don't play chess all the time, but I like doing it with my kids. Um, I do jujitsu. It's kind of like playing chess with your body a little bit. It's much more painful. <laughs> but it teaches you how to think, if I do this, then this can happen. And you have a branching tree of arguments and replies. And the goal is to just become familiar. Oh, if they if they do this, I'll just I'll do that. Now you can't be robotic. You have to be able to think on your feet. But the more you prepare, the more you can be like, oh. I'm I'm used to this. This is this. I I know where this is going, and then you've got a better way to respond. Excellent. All right, we have a lot more questions, yeah, but we're going to take a quick break for our sponsor. So you guys, I'm very picky about my skincare. I always have been. I tried a lot of products, high end products, low end products, all different kinds of products over the years, and it's been very hard for me to find a line that I like. Multiple products, and I'll keep using. And that's why I'm so excited to share about Nimi Skincare. Nimi Skincare first caught my eye because it's a beautiful brand. They've got great sourcing of their ingredients, but they're also a pro-life, pro-family company. So when I tried their product for the first time, I was surprised to discover that I love using Nimi Skincare. I love their moisturizer, which I use every night. I love using their vitamin C scrub. I love using their sunscreen. They have all kinds of other products. I think you're going to love Nimi Skincare. Give them a try. It's NimiSkincare.com. That's N-I-M-I, Nimi skincare.com. And for the holidays, you can use the code Lila at checkout for 15% off your order. That's NimiSkincare.com. Support a pro-life, pro-family company. Try some amazing product and use the code Lila at checkout for 15% off your order. That's NimiSkincare.com. Right. All right. We're back here with Trent Horn. We are doing a live, put questions in the chat. We're talking about the Whatever podcast yesterday, Catholic apologetics and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, all right, Trent, another question that just came in through the chat. 
from Daniel Peters. Question for Trent. What was the hardest or the most frustra frustrating moment in the debate yesterday? The comments on the video, video are pretty positive. What did you think? I think just frustrating for me was I wanted to really focus on particular moral claims and mm -hmm. they would try to shift and get away from them. Like I wanted them to explain why is it disordered? Why is it unhealthy for friends to demand exclusive friendship? Mm. But it's not unhealthy. In fact, it's expected to demand exclusive sexual relationships. Because if sex can mean whatever you want, if we identify that one exchange of feelings to be exclusive is unhealthy, like friendship, then why wouldn't you say that about people who choose sexual monogamy? If you choose friendly monogamy, and I just wanted to push that, but sometimes it's hard, you know, people will squirm out or immediately <laughs> shift the subject, try to get out of things. So those, mm -hmm. I was trying very hard to show that their worldview cannot explain these very basic moral intuitions we have about what sex is for, friendship is for, what is our human nature. And so I think that would be frustrating at some points. I think there is also difficulty. I think it was important that we had empirical studies to back up the uh, problems that pornography and prostitution cause in society. Uh, I think there's always a danger when you present an empirical defense that the other side will just say, okay, you have your studies, I have my mm -hmm. studies, which is what Jasmine did also. I have my studies also, which I looked at those studies. I've looked at them as well. Like I cited some of them. I cited a study from 2013 by Nicole Prouse. Prouse is a very fervent pro porn advocate. Uh, she's had beef with Matt Frad for a while, uh, and she's has studies to try to downplay this idea this is that porn could ever be some kind of an addiction. Yet I cited her study because her very studies do show the changes in the brain and uh, what happens when people have greater, lesser Q reactivity to pornography. So even her own research indirectly makes the points that I would be making. I think it could be frustrating mm -hmm. when we're talking about like porn addiction, people go over that really fast. It's like, I think what Jasmine was almost treating, like, no, it's not like alcohol addiction. And I agree, like, if you take alcohol away from an alcoholic, they might die. But if you take porn away from someone, they're probably not going to die. But that's why I like using compulsion. Mm -hmm. It's just like, there's a thing you do, and you don't want to do it anymore, but you feel like you can't mm -hmm. stop. Like, to, to deny there are people who feel that way about pornography, to borrow the phrase you, you gave in the debate, a very good one, is to live in unreality. Mm -hmm. That there, or that... Well, it's they just shouldn't feel bad about pornography. And as I said in the debate, that's like saying to a gambling addict, well, you should just stop feeling bad about losing money. You should mm -hmm. stop feeling bad about gambling. You're not you you only feel bad about gambling because you know you're worried about losing your money and it's you you have a moral incongruence. No, the point is when you're in a position and you feel like you can't stop doing something, it's a compulsion. And it's changed your brain to make you feel like you need to do that. And porn does that to people. Mm -hmm. Uh what did you think of Destiny's response to that? line of argument about how pornography you can see in brain scans that lights up parts of the brain that need more and more stimulation to keep lighting up, which was the argument about yeah. increasingly extreme forms of pornography are needed for users yeah. to get the kind of the dopamine hit that they're seeking. Right. Um, but you know, I think uh, Destiny, if I remember correctly, dismissed it by saying, well, when you eat a cheeseburger, your yeah. brain lights up. So, so what? Well, you know, well, that was but I response. would say that anything that makes you compelled that mm -hmm. isn't good for you. Because I think this was something that was kind of lost. Like the yep. prompt was, is is sex work, quote unquote. Is it, is it bad yeah. for society? Because mm -hmm. you could even hold the position, you're neutral on the morality, and you say it's just bad for people's health. Like you could say, I'm not saying smoking cigarettes is right or wrong, it's just not good for you. Like you could hold that view, and you could even hold that view about mm -hmm. pornography. So I think I would, maybe if I could go back, i say, you know, I agree. I could agree with you that sugar, flour probably creates may create similar <laughs> may create similar pathways in the brain that can lead to compulsive behavior but i would i would say though do the studies show that pornography does that in a very distinct way mm -hmm. and then also say what about the harms i and i would say that the harms of you know excessive sugar intake i think pale in comparison to the harms that uh, you know pornography intake does to people like that it it's it's like what, what Jesus says: uh, Do not fear the one that can destroy the body; fear the one that can mm -hmm. destroy the soul. You know, and even if you're not religious, you can talk about soul in the sense of you're becoming a person to become a person that is aroused by simulated violence mm -hmm. and degradation. That is to lose even the non-religious sense of the soul. Mm -hmm.
I thought part of the conversation that was really interesting that unfortunately didn't get as much space mm -hmm. because it was a, it it wasn't as much a debate as a discussion. You know, it really was a free flow of a, of ideas and free for all cross examines and everything else. But yeah. um, but I did think this question of what is sex for? Yes, and Destiny did. I you know to his credit, he did try to say this is a separate question. Then, I mean, they're related, but then right. is it? like good or bad at not at, you know as a net to society right um what is the purpose of it what's the meaning of it you spoke to that i know i spoke to that and uh i don't know that there was did you feel that there was a position that was offered that was yeah. cohesive from jasmine and destiny because they yeah. certainly said sex is for recreation and you need consent right but my view of what they shared was that that's basically the extent and then destiny even seemed to say that this is um, to expect us to put more, you yeah. know, to tie it up more than that and to provide more of a yeah. comprehensive view around that is not necessary. No, I, th I think they gave a minimal answer to the idea of what sex is for. And that's a little bit different of talking about like the value of sex or mm -hmm. sex is just for hedonistic purposes. Uh, yeah, I would say that they gave an extremely minimal definition. And that's why I asked them, like, is there any kind of se sexual behavior that's bad mm -hmm that would only involve consenting adults. And that's why I tried to tease that out of Jasmine more when she'd say, and I asked her, which was, I thought one of the, there were a few different shocking moments in the discussion, but one was just asking her, is it bad for children to see pornography? Mm -hmm. Like, and just the idea like, well, the studies are mixed. I'm like, the studies are mixed. We have laws that can send people to prison for showing she pornography. She couldn't answer that. Because her, 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 her philosophy or her worldview yeah. couldn't support a clear answer because she doesn't have the she, correct She slipped up a little because she, sex, did, so. she did say like, oh, well, some people will see it and they'll see that some things aren't normal. Like, oh, well, what parts mm. of it aren't normal? Let's what is normal? Let's dive into that a little bit more. And so I feel like this view that reduces it all to consent, mm. uh, you really lose the ability to say that any kind of sexual behavior is abnormal in the moral sense or in the virtuous sense rather than just the statistical sense. All right, for those who are just tuning in, Disco Barrage says, what is this about? Was there a second Trent Horn Destiny debate? Yes, there was. I was also there with Trent. <laughs> and then Destiny was joined by a partner, uh, a, a woman named Jasmine Jafar. And it was the question at work. The question before us is, was is sex work bad for society? Yeah, so we are debriefing that. Yeah. Um, okay, there's more questions coming in about some other topics. Sure. I want to get to those because they're really interesting. Some Catholic apologetic stuff, some bioethical stuff. But yeah. any other thoughts? No, I mean, how did you the, feel about show? just like... I feel like you and I have different, uh, it was nice to be able to play off one. It was one of the few times I've done a two on two debate. Usually, usually I have a, like someone asked me to do a two on two atheism debate. And I said, no, there's not really anybody I want to do that kind of a debate with me. So like I passed on that. Nobody on, a on atheism. Uh, it's very few people, but I, I feel like I'd rather just do that one on one. If I, if I did that with someone, uh, especially in the person who was offered, I was offered a debate two on two on atheism a while back. And I didn't, I was familiar with the other person, but I didn't know them that well. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, I'm not interested in that. But this is probably the first, one of the few times I've, or only time I've ever done like a two by two mm -hmm. to where you have another person and you're, you're playing off one another. That was fun. It was fun <laughs> to be able to like, be able to take a break for a little bit when the other person pick up a few things. Well, you did great. <laughs> you can totally, I mean, I, I, you were excellent. So it was, I was coughing and that was a little annoying to people. And I'm I get apologies to the people that, I'm coughing yeah. in the side. I've had this cough for three weeks, but yeah. I mean, you did, you did very, very well. You gave me some really good advice a few months back because we were talking about just debate approach and yeah. preparation and, uh, you know, the format of debates. Mm -hmm. And you said that you are very intentional and thoughtful about not just like the content of the debate, but the format and the you know, who are the presenters right. during a debate, because that can really uh, make or break dynamics of a debate. Yes, it can. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, that was, I mean, I think in, in the past when I've done debates, they're like talk shows, yes. you know, or they have been some podcasts, but it has been one-on-one -on -one, or it's just this big group. Yeah. 
And but it's different when it's like we're having a debate and there's a group of specific people chosen. You didn't necessarily pick your partners. Yeah, totally. You show up and you're like, you know, navigating this situation. Yeah. Uh, and I think you're very prudent to think that through in advance and yes. say, is this a choice I'm going to make to do this one? Or is this better to bow out and find a format that's more yeah. amenable to a constructive conversation? Yeah, exactly. And you do that very, very well. And that's your your channel too. check out Council of Trent on YouTube. <laughs> um yeah, no, I, I, I thought it was it was a pleasure to debate, debate with you. And, um, you know, I, I definitely would have done some things differently. I think, I mean, the coughing obviously was annoying. But I think I, there was, because of such a free flow conversation, yeah. and there were so many things that were left on the table. That's hard, Like yeah. conversations, I mean, there are lines that I started with Destiny and Jasmine that never got completed because right. they got sidetracked by a new argument that was, you know, asserted and then it just, you just couldn't come, you know, close the loop because there was a new argument and you yeah. didn't want to interrupt too many times and, and that's try to interrupt, and, and but that's not why too many I times. like more formal debates mm -hmm. with rounds in them. I like dialogues if we're a bit more, not as feisty, but I think mm -hmm. that that's, this is just the format that, that whatever would prefer mm -hmm. just kind of go at it. But you're right. It does allow things, threads to be left uh, unraveled. Yeah. So. And that was my background in high school and college to some extent, but was team policy debate. And yeah. you have, you know, eight minutes and eight minutes, and then you have cross-examination and then another eight minutes and then you have five minutes and five minutes. And it's very yeah. ordered in that way. Um, but I would have, I think, just let you take it a few more times because I was engaging with Destiny, but, and you, you engaged uh, many times and did, uh, yeah, did yeah. very, very well, but you had a lot to say and you were doing doing so well. So it was, it, it was a, a pleasure to be partnered with someone who is so competent and, no, I, I liked, and excellent at debating. I, I so remember thank there was you. a moment though, like when we were talking with Jasmine about the dignity of work and I was really glad that you just like, a f like I made a point, it got roundabout and then you brought it right back and affirmed it. And what you were like, what Trent is saying is this and that's true. And like, good, it's, it's all coming together. So there was, there was a nice interplay. All right. If there's not any other comments on whatever, and again, yeah. thank you to whatever for hosting oh, it. Oh, yeah, it was great. And thank you to Brian and Jasmine for showing up and doing that Absolutely. debate because, yeah. it, you know, these things, three hours of conversation about this stuff is not easy. And, you know, before a live audience that's often roasting you in the comment section. Yeah. So I, I think I want to, I might mention one more thing. I think yeah, some, some people were critical of me because at one point I was critical mm -hmm. of Destiny's uh, polyamorous relationship and they said like and it's come out now that he and his wife who have been involved in polyamory are, are getting divorced <laughs> saying like that that was a low blow something to go after and it was not something i planned to bring up we had, i planned not to talk about that but i felt it was justified because i felt that destiny made a uncharitable jab we were talking about the issue of consent mm -hmm. And he just straight up said, well, you don't understand consent because you're religious. And he had frequently been using essentially ad hominem attacks. You're wrong because you're religious. You're bad because you're religious. And then by saying you don't understand consent because mm -hmm. you're religious is a way of saying because you're religious, you're like indifferent to rape. Because if you don't understand consent, what does that mean? That means that you're going to have some kind of problematic view towards rape. And that's when I said, no, the person who doesn't understand the nature of consent is you. And I felt then at that point, it's fair to bring up if you're going to attack something that's important to me, my religion, and say it leads to something bad, I'm going to publicly point out that something you believe in, that it's perfectly fine for your spouse to have mm -hmm. sex with other people, that this leads to very mm -hmm. bad things, and that you've promoted this destructive behavior that some people might imitate mm -hmm. it to their own detriment. And mm -hmm. I think it's good to point out it's it's for whom the bell tolls. Yeah, for it whom is the told, bell tolls. And with that, we're going to do one more quick sponsor break here. Everylife.com is America's pro-life baby product company. Diapers and wipes, which are ethically sourced, high-quality products from a company that supports your pro-life values and donates back to the pro-life movement. I love everylife.com. This is the company. If you're listening, you've got a baby in your life, you've got a niece or nephew, you've got a kid, this is the company to use the diapers and wipes from. You can go to everylife.com today. You can order a trial package or you can order a subscription. Again, fantastic quality, ethically sourced. It's going to be great for your little one everylife.com. And you can use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. That's everylife.com and Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. All right, Trent, you were just talking about why you chose to mention on the podcast, yeah. which I know it was a, it, a very... Um, and it was a heated moment anyways. We were just both getting heated. But yeah. I, I do not felt that it was unfair. Like, 
I don't think it would be fair to bring up to someone if you're going through a private marital difficulty mm -hmm. and it's not related to the things being discussed, uh, like if you're just debating atheism or something. But the fact of the matter is, if you publicly defend a destructive lifestyle and you, you, and you set this off as an example to others that is acceptable if they want to choose to emulate it, then I believe you've waived the right mm. to not be criticized of that, to say, look, it has led to a destructive consequence. We, you don't want to see, other people shouldn't have to, uh, should be able to take a lesson from that. And, and normally I wouldn't have, but I feel like if he was going to attack something that is important and foundational to my life, religion, then I, I think it was fair to bring up. Well, and I think the other point there is it's not that you were revealing information that was It was private. already public knowledge. It was public information. And yeah. yes, it, I feel very badly for what Destiny is going through. And I, I hope things work out very well for him in the end. But I think to your point, this is a, a kind of a clash of lifestyles right. that are chosen after, we hope, carefully deliberated decisions about how we, should we live. Right. You know, how is, what is the right way to live as human beings? Right. Um, is God real? What does God have to say? Right. What is, um, what is sex for? What is marriage for? Right. And it, I think the accusations that were made sometimes, well, you're just Catholic, so you have to believe this. And you and I both chose, we weren't even raised Catholic. And most people, so. even people who are not religious, mm -hmm. would find it absurd to think that you can have an exclusive emotional connection to someone uh, in a marriage, quote unquote, mm -hmm. but be fine with that person having sex with other people. It doesn't, doesn't take a religious person. It just takes a grounded person to see that that's, that's absurd. Okay. We're going to do one more, or maybe two more quick comments on whatever from the chat. Thank you guys so much for putting your questions in here. Then we're going to go a couple other directions on some apologetic yeah. stuff, which are coming in, which are fun. All right. One more thing on the chat for the reallys. When the, when planning the debate, would you have ever thought that destiny would say bestiality is somehow better than killing an animal that was somehow inadvertently stated or purposefully in the I, debate that I, bestiality I is better than killing an animal. It is better to yeah, well, I, I, have sexual I, acts with an animal than it is to kill them. I'll discuss this in an episode. I already recorded this episode Looking a while ago. Looking forward to that coming out. Yeah, so I'd already had broached the topic because I wanted to talk about that singer, Peter Singer reference to the bestiality article. I anticipated and thinking in my head, well, how would they go about rebutting this. And I felt like, and I thought in my head before it would happen as we were sitting there, oh, ja and I said, Jasmine, you'll probably, it was interesting in the engagement, I said, here is my argument, why is this wrong? Jasmine, I bet you would say this, this is why it's wrong. And she said, yes, I would say that. I'm like, okay, but here's why that argument doesn't work. And then Destiny said, you're right, that isn't why the argument, that's why the argument doesn't work. And I anticipated that what Destiny often does is he'll just bite the bullet on claims. He did. We did that before when we debated abortion. If it leads to a morally repugnant conclusion, fine, whatever. Maybe it's not that morally repugnant. Mm -hmm. We have to get over our feelings about that situation. Mm -hmm. But I think many times there's a philosopher, Martha Nussbaum. No, sorry. This is Nussbaum's reply to this, but I think she's wrong. Leon Cass wrote an article called The Wisdom of Repugnance. And then many times in bioethics, Great article. yeah, bioethics, that sense <laughs> of repugnance mm -hmm. uh, can be a morally worthwhile intuition to discover whether something is in accord with human nature. So I, I did anticipate that that they would probably just have to bite the bullet because their view of sexuality left them really no other yeah. options. It, it, if, if consent is all that matters, then you, right. when you test that that sort of standard of consent, when it comes to animals, it's there's a lot of gray area, so it opens right. the door to bestiality. Yeah. Um, a couple more comments. The young Catholics love you both. Trent, your wife is my fave. Isn't she great, <laughs> Laura? Uh, too far with Laura Horn. Um, shout out. Give her my love. The debate was amazing, and although I am biased, I think each side's conclusions and concessions showed us who won. Um, lots of uh, very positive things here. Um, Logan F. Also, Destiny deserves some kudos because he showed up to the debate with a sensitive topic affecting his life. Sure. A lot of people would have dropped out if news like that dropped about them. No, and I appreciate that he, I really appreciate that Destiny is going mm -hmm. through a difficult time. I understand that that's difficult. And I do appreciate that he continued on with the debate while going through that. So I do give him credit for that. And I did not plan to want to bring that up. But it was after about two and a half hours of it was that by the end of our conversation when that came up mm -hmm. and we had been vigorously engaging each other. And at the same time, if you are going to not in the context of a debate, but make an accusation mm -hmm. that people who are religious don't understand things like consent, 
then I'm going to put my foot down. I'm not going to allow you to make those accusations while coming from a moral perspective that seems perfectly fine when it's not. Well said. All right. Uh, now kind of shifting topics a little bit from the podcast yesterday, the whatever debate or discussion. Uh, Will Judy asks, hi, Trent and Lila. What is both of your takes on adopting frozen embryos? Mm. I did some research and found that the church does not have a clear yeah. stance on it. Would love to hear your answers. Trent, what are your thoughts? So I'm, I'm working with the National Catholic Bioethics Center right now uh, on being an editor, a co-editor of an anthology uh, dealing with human embryo adoption. We have, it's the second edition, but we're completely reworking the book. And it's got a slate of Catholic authors, both for and against uh, the permissibility of it. And I think I lean morally towards being against it, but I have not, it's a, it's a complex issue. There's a lot of arguments for and against. So I haven't reached a firm position. In fact, I might, if there's time in the editing process, add my own chapter <laughs> that my view would basically be, mostly it's a pragmatic argument, that I would say it's something, even if it were right, it should be inadmissible. It's something for pragmatic reasons we ought not do, because it will invariably create a market for IVF, like, oh, well, these extra embryos get adopted anyways, and there's too many practical concerns I have. But the principle of whether it's right or wrong, I lean against, but there's a lot of arguments on, on each side, so I'm not firmly committed yet. Well, there is the potentially the potential um, number of a million embryos who are basically frozen yeah. in the United States alone, and the question is, what should become of them? Yeah. Some of them may be cho chosen in the future by the parents that brought them into the world right. to continue the process and allow them to grow in, yeah. in the womb of their mother or a surrogate, and then some will be used for research and some will be disconnected, but some are just right now kind of in suspension. They're in this deep freeze. Right. So, uh, you know, that's the, the humanitarian crisis, I would yes, call it, it the is. human rights abuse of doing that to a human life. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I mean, I think I, I agree with you, your position in that it's complicated. There's not, you know, the church obviously hasn't taken a position, a position on it. I'm sympathetic to the idea of, you know, it, the, the problem is if you take a married woman mm -hmm. and you prepare her for embryo implantation, there's things you have to do to her body to basically, you know, act as if she's already pregnant so she can receive that embryo. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be problematic if she's, you know, actually having sex with her husband and won't be able to get pregnant with her husband with their child. Mm -hmm. um, so there's all these sort of ethical issues with yeah. a married couple adopting an embryo and the risk to the woman and the risk to, you know, their own you know, marital love together, potentially. Yeah, should, should, uh, the only person who impregnates her would be like her husband, not a lab technician. That's but also, one but also, her body can be hostile to a new life that she is would be like if she's going through that process, her body would be hostile to maybe a new life that she and her husband could conceive. Is mm. like the the question there. So it's it's complicated, and yeah. you know that's why that again the church, the Catholic Church, in its wisdom you know, doesn't, sometimes there are not pronouncements yeah. on things. There are, you know, these are new technologies, they're questionable. And so, you know, in good conscience, you follow your conscience. That's what you do as a Catholic. And that's why, you know, we haven't come out at live action or myself about embryo adoption, like, oh, it's so great, or, oh, it's wrong. It's really, you have to follow your conscience. Yeah. Um, all right, let's see another question about Catholic apologetics. Let me go to this one. So this is from Pi Guy 35 um, Protestant leaning towards Catholicism here. Yeah. What we've been there, or actually I was there. Sure. <laughs> Excuse the cough guys. So sorry. Um, one tough question from my family. Love the tough questions, guys. I know Trent loves them. Yeah. Um, what do you do with the Catholic church burning at the stake or otherwise killing many reformers? Right. Jan Huss as an example. Sure. Go well, Trent. <laughs> what I would say is I would ask the person, what is your what do you do with it? I ask, what is your, is this an argument against Catholicism? So what I wonder is what sort of argument are you making? Are you saying that a church could not be the church that Christ established if it used um, violent and lethal means mm -hmm. to punish uh, heretics, for example? Okay, well, if that's your argument, then I feel like it's going to lead to a lot of other conclusions. For example, 
uh, it's true that the Catholic Church has used capital punishment on heretics, but during the time of the Protestant Reformation, Protestants did this as well. Michael Servetus, for example, was a, a heretic who left Spain. He was being investigated by Catholic authorities. He went to John Calvin's Geneva, and Calvin had him executed. So it's like he, did, he didn't do any much better there either. Uh, I think he was a heretic on the Trinity. <laughs> uh, I think during the Reformation, uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but, you know, I've heard that like um, more Anabaptists were killed mm -hmm. by Protestants then Protestants were killed by Catholics, or uh, the Anabaptists were be they, these were people that Catholics and Protestants both opposed because they believed uh, infant baptism was invalid, and so you had to rebaptize people, Anabaptists baptize mm. again. Uh, so, what I would say is that if also going back into Scripture, we look in the Old Testament to see how capital punishment was used on those who led the worship of the chosen people, led them astray. If you're saying if it was ever used by a religious body, are you gonna, you're not going to believe in the Bible anymore? I think what I would say to that person is, following what the Catechism says, is that throughout salvation history, different methods have been used to promote the common good of society, and they might have been necessary in different times and places. Uh, such as, well, we look in the Old Testament, for example, God tolerated, <laughs> he tolerated divorce in the Old mm -hmm. Testament, but it wasn't ever God's plan, but it was tolerated because it's better than people. Aquinas said the reason for that was to prevent people from murdering their wives, uh, you know, to get out of their marriages, basically. So tolerating divorce, uh, aspects of slavery in the ancient world, and using uh, capital punishment, not just for heresy, but throughout the history, you know, throughout the history of the Western world, Capital punishment could be used for people who committed things like grand theft, you know, hunting on the Lord's land. And uh, but we see now or adultery even. But we see more and more no, even people who are pro-death penalty don't want to apply it in those circumstances to see that the church has said that while some of these actions might have had a justification in certain social contexts to pr promote the social order when you don't have prisons, you know, and things like that, or if heretics are going to destabilize the whole mm -hmm. social order, it doesn't mean that that was necessarily God's intention for, um, for his people for all time. And so we can see that some of these things, they might have had their place. Now we ought not do them. We ought not do them anymore. So if this person's concerned, I think Protestants would feel the same way, that they don't act like magisterial reformers did when they had the same view about um, dealing with heresy. So I would say that if that's your concern, any argument that you would make that would re release Protestants from their pre and the Bible from its previous use of this would also apply to, to Catholics as well. One thing that gives me a lot of confidence when I hear about any number of, uh, you know, whether they're gray area, quite you know, questionable acts that right. you know Catholic Catholics in the hierarchy have committed or you know, whatever the sins are of any number yeah. of Catholics, of which there are many, my, right. I'm first among them. Uh, yes, all Catholics are sinners, <laughs> yeah. um, except for Jesus and Mary. But anyways, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, 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 one thing that gives me a lot of confidence when I, when I like study the history of the church, which is full of, you know, interesting characters. There've been a few bad popes, you know, there've been there some have. very bad bishops. There've also been some amazing ones and saints is that in matters of faith and morals, that's where the teaching, you know, cannot be, you know, cannot be uh, poisoned. I mean, you're going to have the Holy Spirit protecting the church yeah. on these certain matters of faith and morals. That doesn't mean the practice of the thing will right. always be perfect. And, and, the, so, and the catechisms talk about how uh, the church had used methods of Roman law, even things like torture, mm -hmm. that it adopted that um, maybe it should not have used in its judicial practice. And maybe. Also, yeah, or that, yeah, it should not have used. Is torture always wrong, would you would you say? It depends what you mean by the term torture, okay. I guess. Okay, all right. That's going to, that'd be a bit too difficult. That's, a, I would that's say, an interesting, that's another debate for another day. The, the, well, I the, am anti-torture, by the way. <laughs> well, that, that gets back to, like, I would say, this is similar to the lying debate. Mm -hmm. I would say torture and lying are wrong. But depends what you mean. You have but, to but define them. Torture yes. and lying. So yeah, it's. Um, but I would say that also throughout church history, remember that the church and the state were intertwined in a way that they aren't today. Mm. Uh, that even during the Reformation, you basically had Protestant kingdoms or Catholic kingdoms, and so a person's religious beliefs were seen as either constitutive of or detrimental to the social order, and that they could be punished similar to how we punish treason today. It's a great point. You have to look at the context that yeah. those decisions were made within. Um, 
and yeah, there was, you know, they were, they were, they were ruling in a civil sense, not just in a yes. religious sense. And so what does that, what are the, the, the difficult choices that a civil ruler has to make? And sometimes they're very pragmatic and complicated. So, and there's gray areas. Um, but again, and again, not to say it was right for anyone to burn anyone at the stake. So they, we, I think you right. would agree that that's wrong. Yeah, to burn I, someone at the stake. But yeah, I, I, I would. Like, say, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, we have to do you think these, it's right, Trent? Well, well I mean, these puni these punishments were in instituted in the Old Testament, for example. You know, so. But would you? Say, well, I mean, have you done the death penalty on your channel yet? I've I've talked about it before okay. a while back. I mean the. Uh, uh, Oh, this is, we're going which, to interesting which, waters here. Yeah, we, I mean, the, the the death penalty prescribed, you know, uh, execution of people for, for heresy and other crimes, including by burning. Uh, whether that is God, you know, God is allowing ancient people to use a law code that was most familiar to them and was most familiar for society. But would you support properly. it, I think, is the question. Would I, would I support yeah. it? I, I definitely wouldn't. I don't support... What I have seen today, and I think that we've seen progress in the development of the relationship between church and state, what I support today is I think that when the church, some people say, oh, I don't like separation of church and state, but I feel like that the, the church has thrived a lot in the United States, for example. Like when you compare churches in the United States versus, like the, the Catholic Church in the United States versus Catholic churches in Europe. Like in Europe, while they're a lot more secular, they still have a lot of the vestiges of um, Catholic or Protestant kingdoms. Like in Germany, there's the church tax, where you you write down what religion you belong to, and a portion of your tax dollars go to the church. So you can have church, the Catholic Church in Germany, <laughs> where people are leaving, but somehow their incomes keep going up because of the church tax. And so where you have the state backing churches, and allowing them to be propped up in this sense by the state, I think they can become barren and lifeless by because they have the power of the state propping them up instead of the vibrant holiness and vigor of the, the people just voluntarily promoting them, like we see here in the U.S., where churches are not um, similar in Canada, where you have uh, Catholic schools that are essentially run by the government. A lot of these cases, they're teaching things that are not very Catholic. But here, where you have Catholic schools that are just completely cut off from government funds, government intervention, uh, you can you can have that ability to thrive more. And so I think ultimately, we have seen a lot of, of good in that respect versus using um, the the power of the state. And, I, and the, the church has always taught that the state should not coerce people to be Catholic. Like Aquinas taught that forcible baptisms of Jews, mm -hmm. for example, are wrong. Forced baptisms are invalid. Uh, I think we start to see more about the danger of trying to use the state to achieve certain goods that maybe there are other spiritual ways to attain them. Mm. But the state but, should still achieve some goods, like the state should outlaw abortion and outlaw right. things that are terrible. But I think when it comes, I mean, my yeah. sort of basic argument about the death penalty is, no, it's not acceptable. The only time you can argue, in my opinion, that it is useful, it's good, it's acceptable, mm -hmm. is when you are dealing with a rule of law situation where you don't have the infrastructure mm -hmm. to keep really dangerous criminals that are yeah. totally disrupting society uh, away from society. And so you yeah. have to use the death penalty because you don't have, you know, uh, maximum security prisons <laughs> to put people yeah. in. But with the infrastructure we have now, that's why I, I, I see yeah, the death even, penalty as wrong. And, but but even particularly- in very, Even in very poor countries, they've abolished the death penalty. Mm -hmm. The death penalty tends to only be used now in places like Muslim theocracies right. or North Korea. But burning at the stake as a form of the death penalty, I think is particularly torturous. Yeah, I and think, I would I think say we, absolutely I, no. Yeah, I would, absolutely no to yeah, that. I would say no. And I would say that even if this kind of punishment were allowed in, in like the Old mm -hmm. Testament, uh, we have developed in our understanding of the natures of punitive measures, uh, and I think that it is it is something that, yeah, it certainly could not be justified. All right. Um, death penalty. There we went. We went, we went there yeah. a, a little bit here. Okay, so a question from, where is she? I just saw her. Maria, or Marta, excuse me, Marta M. Have either of you ever had doubts about the priestly celibacy mm. or the Catholic versus Protestant question, basically. Well, we can start to try the, the, the celibacy one. I've never really had doubts about being Catholic since I've been Catholic. Uh, or doubts that celibacy, because celibacy is not, yeah. my understanding of it, it's not something that, yes, of course it is required of priests today, most priests, most priests. but that hasn't always been the case. Yeah. And 
also it po it has a potential to change in the future. You don't, yeah, by it, nature, being a priest have to be not it, unmarried. It's a discipline of the church. And the question of priestly celibacy is an interesting one. Uh, for several years, my wife and I attended a Byzantine Catholic church. We've attended different Byzantine Catholic churches, some with celibate priests, some with married priests. Uh, so I've, I've had the pleasure of knowing both. They're, they're great men. In the Eastern Catholic Church, it's more common to have married priests. Some married Anglican priests become married Western priests when they're received into the church. Uh, but it's a discipline that could change, you know, to, to require or dispense from celibacy. But the practical arguments for changing it or not, it, th that gets to more interesting practical arguments. Uh, I'm not, you know, fiercely opposed to a change like that. But at the same time, I think that a priest, like when they're all in black to show that they are dead to the world, they're alive in Christ, that they've renounced everything to follow the kingdom. Celibacy is a very good thing. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, he wishes all could be celibate like him, uh, because you're able to fully devote yourself to God. It's a beautiful witness. And I think it's important to, for more people to see that and to be able to live it out joyfully. So I don't, I'm don't. i very opposed to the idea of dispensing from the obligation of celibacy because we just need more priests, like we need to make the job more attractive. That is a, a dangerous attitude. I feel like a lot of the problems we have, and I'm actually really excited about where the priesthood's going in the next 30 years. Um, they've done studies showing that priests who self-identify as progressive or orthodox or conservative, more conservative in their leanings as, as priests, like theologically conservative, that has grown tremendously since 2002 on. And I think there's a reason for that. Mm. Uh, I think, honestly, a lot of the problems we see, like priests, they're just like, what are you doing here? Or just a lot of other issues with them. I think like back in like the 50s through the 70s or the 80s, you'd have, and this is something that's, by the way, has happened throughout church history. So during the Reformation, the mm -hmm. Council of Trent said uh, people born out of wedlock could not be admitted to seminary because what happened was people would send mm -hmm. their 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 failure kids just to the priesthood, almost that, like an orphanage. Basically, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what what do you get from that? You have priests that are not literate, priests that have concubines. It was a mess. And I think a lot of times one of the the motivations in the 20th century for people <laughs> to become a priest was, hey, and th people told me this. You know, it's a great job. It's you know you've got a lot of great benefits. People love you. It's it was like, and there were abuses. I mean, you mentioned concubines and illiteracy, yeah. but there well, were. I'm, I'm talking about in the 20th century, though. Mm -hmm. People are told, like, and to be honest, that I'm sure there are people who are told, like, oh, you know, if if you don't like women, you know, being a priest, it's a pretty good, like, no one's going to ask any questions about you. That I think is one of the biggest uh, misunderstandings mm -hmm. about the priesthood, because you meant you made a great point a moment earlier about, you know, I don't think, you know this idea of revo we should revoke the celibacy requirement because right. we get more priests suddenly because these guys who want to be married can be priests. By the way, there's a diaconate where you can be married and right. you can do some part of the priestly ministry that are not restricted right. from you, where you can give homilies, you can marry, you can baptize. We need a lot when you can preach. It's, not, can like, preach. it's not like there's a bunch of married men. married deacons. They're not knocking down the door for that. So why well, would they? Well, because people yeah. don't know it's an option. I think that's part of it. But, but what I was going to say is a lot of people, I think, uh, yeah, there was in the 60s and 70s people entering the seminary who maybe shouldn't have, yeah. who struggled with same-sex attraction or other hey, sexual hey, issues, hey, yeah. and that the priesthood became kind of a cover for it, and that became very toxic. That's why the CDF said in 2005, people with deep-seated same-sex mm -hmm. attractions cannot be admitted to the priesthood. Hmm. Deep-seated, not just transitory, not just something you struggled with at one point, like in adolescence. But that makes sense but to me. But a recurring struggle that's For example, been I think priests would benefit in just because you're celibate doesn't mean you have to be lonely. Like, I think it's good for priests to live in community, to have a house, like a parish serve or a house with three priests who live together. That's going to be difficult, though, if you have sexual attractions to the people you live with. You know, so that's why, you know, there's this practical elements there <laughs> along with the other psychological elements. But here's why I think, though, the difference about people thinking the the more conservative priests are coming in the future. I think before 2002, it was cool to be a priest. It was socially respectable to be a priest. Mm. It was not socially respectable to be LGBT. It was coming up. It was happening. But prior to that point, like, oh, a priest, father so-and-so, fight the demons. Like, people didn't really... The priests were, like, cool. These are a cool part of society. You had television shows about priests, and they were just a, a stock, nice 
character for Catholics to look up to before 2002. And LGBT was still on its rise. It was still something that, you know, people were generally opposed to so-called same-sex marriage. Think about that and all that, right? But now after 2002, 20 years after that, where are we? It's totally socially respectable mm. to be LGBT. So now, like, if you were like in the 20th <laughs> century and you're like, oh, you know, it's not, people won't respect me for being LGBT, so I wanna be a priest. Mm. No, if you go out and identify as LGBT, you, you can get all kinds of social respect on TikTok and social media. But if you want social respect today, do you become a priest? No. But that might be a good thing, that the people who do want to be a priest, like if, it's not like back in the 70s, if someone, want, and of course there are many good people during that time who chose to be a priest. I'm not maligning anyone who was, or everyone ordained during that period. But it might be more likely, you know, you have someone looking, oh, I want to be socially respected and so I'll become a priest and it's a cushy deal and da da da. But I think the vast majority of today, men who go into the priesthood know this is going to be rough. I'm going to choose this vocation and people are going to make fun of me and claim that I'm like a really bad person who does bad things in secret. But I don't care because I want to serve Christ in his church. Those kinds of people, they've got the heart and the desire to serve the Lord that uh, thrives in that kind of in adversity, spiritual adversity. So that, that gives me a lot of hope to see the people that are choosing the priesthood now in spite of social disrespectability, I'm excited to see where the church will be as they as they progress. Amen. Every I feel every new seminarian I meet and new priest I meet yeah. are rock stars. They're like really believe what they uh, what they preach, what they live, and they've taken the time to make sacrifices to stick with it in a society that is yeah. often hostile to too increasingly because, hostile to because the priesthood there because was of the, yeah. the bad, there you was know, the time, scandals. That there have been horrible scandals. There was a time when Catholicism was mostly still, the culture could mostly be behind it. Mm -hmm. Like if you think about when Sinead O'Connor ripped up that picture of the Pope on Saturday Night Live, like sat, like people like SNL and the widestream, more widestream culture uh, really criticized her about that. Now today, if you did that, people would be like, che you know, cheering you on. Uh, Maybe but, not as much with this pope. Well, I you it depends know depends who's ripping the picture. You know what, but... pope, pope Francis is funny. There will be people who God will, bless the yeah, Holy Father. Will, will, <laughs> they'll cheer him on like he's mm. you know in favor of all LGBT. And I'll ask those people. You know, he said that gender ideology is a dangerous colonization <laughs> that hurts people. What do you think of that? Conveniently, yeah. Not aware of well, it. one of the one of the arguments I've heard about against priestly celibacy is mm. we'll look at the sex abuse scandals. This is a consequence yeah. of celibacy, and I find that that's such silly. a such a silly argument because what are you saying? You're saying people should get married, and that's the way they should deal with sexual attraction to children. Yeah. You're going to offload that onto some wife. Plus, I mean, it sounds horrible. That's not the way to deal with plus there are so, sexual attraction to there children. Are so you should get many, treatment. Sorry, I'm interrupting you. I feel like we're back no, on whatever. I'm so sorry. No, we're you're good. Excited. You're good. Go for it. Uh, I Making just feel like there points. are so many cases of married people who engage in sexual misconduct with children. Um, you're uh, always hearing some story horrible. about uh, like teachers, like young female teachers who engages, who are married, who have husbands, and they're doing this with their with their students. It's uh, sexual abuse is not a Catholic problem; it's a human yeah. problem. It's a it's a human problem that's universal across humanity. It's sin, and it requires a variety of things: spiritual, emotional, legal. Uh, to be able to to combat this in and of itself, that's not going to just saying, oh, just like, get married, there won't be any abuse. No, to stop abuse, you have to <laughs> implement safeguards and instill a culture that refuses to make excuses mm -hmm. for bad behavior and always is above board and transparent and keeping people safe. And you need a better vetting process, which the church is working on. And now on we that. have that, yeah. And we have that. Yeah. Uh, no, well said. I, I I totally agree. Okay, we've got a few more minutes yeah, with Trent it. Horn. <laughs> we've got some more questions coming in. Um, someone just asked, Christina Canto, just arrived. What are we talking about? We just talked about the Whatever podcast. We talked about some of Trent's background. Now we're doing Q&A on a lot of theological questions, some yeah. Catholic apologetic stuff, gotten some good evangelical questions coming in um, and otherwise. So keep them coming. Okay, this is a good one from James Coffey. I like this one. Today's a very special day. Immaculate Conception. Today's the day of the Immaculate Conception. That's when we're filming. Yeah. Um, well, we're live. Forgot that. Um, December 8th, Trent, Immaculate Conception question. Why is the title Full of Grace given to Mary by the angel Gabriel? Does that title appear anywhere else in scripture? What does this mm -hmm. tell us about the Immaculate Conception? Well, I would say, so that title, 
it's it's not a formal title per se. So in Luke one twenty eight, the angel Gabriel says to Mary, and Luke records it in Greek, Kyrie kikara tomene, hail full of grace. So he actually does not say hail Mary full of grace. We say that in our prayer. He doesn't actually refer to Mary by her name Miriam. He just says hail full of grace. And that like her new name is full of grace. Yeah, it's used kind of sense. as yeah as as <laughs> if it were a name or as if it were a a, a title. A title. Mm-hmm. Uh, not necessarily replacing her name, but it's a very interesting title that's used. Uh, uh, so kara tu means graced or grace filled, and the grammatical form of kara tamene mm-hmm. points towards the idea of grace being kind of like an indicative part of Mary's life. It's not a proof of it. Uh, Kikara Tomene is used in the book of Sirach to refer to a grace-filled man in general, but it doesn't mean that that man was like immaculately <laughs> conceived. But I think the fact that it is used, and it's used as this kind of a, a title for Mary by Gabriel, is very unique um, in, in that respect. And so I think it it certainly points very much towards the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. Uh, when I present evidence, you know, for different Catholic beliefs, I think it is. I think it's important not to overstate the evidence. Uh, so I, I rarely will say, "Oh, this proves it in the Bible," unless like it's really locked down a strap. I think there's a lot of evidence in Scripture and in history that points towards the, you know, that that definitive, you know, that definitively point towards the truth of this doctrine uh, and coheres. With what you know, what the church teaches about it, and not just also not just scripture and tradition. <laughs> I find an argument from reason I find really interesting from um, Jack Mulder Jr. I, I like this argument. So the argument goes like this: that so God uh, chose a teenage girl to become pregnant. God impregnated a teenage girl to bring the Savior into the world, and He allowed that teenage girl to freely say yes or no to that. But consider this situation: if a if a woman chooses to become pregnant, and if part of her reason is she's afraid of what the other party is going to do to her, like punish her, if she says no, that's kind of a skeezy situation, right? Like if if somebody's like, okay, yeah, we can get pregnant because <laughs> I'm worried that you might punish me or do something bad to me if I don't let you impregnate me, that's really bad. It's a bad situation. So. Could and there is there are um, people very upset with Christianity because they believe God coerced right. Mary. That's right. The Holy and, Spirit. It was it, almost like a assault of of sorts. And you can but you can argue for coercion to say God has a habit in the Old Testament that when He asks people to do something and they say no, He punishes them. Look what happened to Jonah. You know, look what mm-hmm. happened to other people. So even if God doesn't make a, a, an explicit promise of pun- warning of punishment or threat of punishment, past behavior could still have a coercive effect on this Hebrew girl, Mary, like, I know what God said in the Old Testament. If I say no, you know, what's he going to do now? So God would never want her to be in a position like that she's only saying (laughs) yes because she's afraid of what will happen if she says no. So that gives evidence for perhaps then for God Mm -hmm. to still be all good, that he prepared Mary her entire life so that she was never in a position to be that saying no would be out of fear of punishment, that she's in a position where she always does what is God's will. And so she knows that if she says no, in this case to God, she is not contradicting his will. And so she's free to say no or yes. Well, to put Mary in that kind of position where she she's always doing God's will, you'd have to make her free from sin. And that provides, I think, a very strong philosophical argument for the plausibility of the Immaculate Conception, that it's necessary uh, it's some people get the necessity wrong. By the way, they say, "Oh, well, Mary had to be free from sin so that Jesus is free from sin." Uh, that doesn't work because Mary is free from sin, even though Saint Anne was not free from sin. So that's not a good argument. But the necessity is more that Mary is free to be able to say yes to God, fully say yes to the divine plan of the incarnation, because she could have also chosen no without <laughs> fear of punishment, because everything she does is in accord with God's will. And you have to understand sort of the the teaching on the wound of original sin, right? As opposed to the idea of the you know total depravity. Although right. you're, what you're describing works actually with the, with the um, the you know the argument for total depravity that if Mary was totally depraved, you know, right? Um, and certainly if Mary was wounded by sin, in addition, like you're saying, it would have been much more difficult for her maybe to say yes without feeling coerced. That's right. Yeah. 
And so I think that's a beautiful explanation that God predispositioned her and protected her from the wound of original sin. So that so sin that does not play any part in the fiat. In the fiat, It's a yeah. full and free yes. Yeah, and Adam and Eve were truly free in the garden. So yes, it's, because, again, not because to they say, were free from sin as well. Yes, and, 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 and that's the other thing. When we are free from sin, free from the wound of sin, it's not that we can't still choose evil. Adam and Eve could choose evil. Right. Mary could have chosen evil, but she obviously never did. Right. Obviously, I know that's the argument, right? It was it obvious, but um, yeah, no, great, great answer, Trent. Okay, we've got just a couple more minutes. Um, people are enjoying this, so thanks, people in the chat, for your comments in here. Um, what, what? I, I'm, I'm gonna kind of maybe we'll close off this Catholic apologetic session okay. that we've sort of landed into here. We did get a pro life question. Let's do the pro life question really quick, and then I wanna okay. we'll close out on Catholic apologetics. Um, yeah, yeah. We had a question from. SJ, SGK, um, what are your views about using the term fetus? Mm. I teach a high school pro-life apologetics class, and there is disagreement about whether or not using the term fetus is appropriate mm. during dialogue. Your thoughts, Trent? It depends, first. but when I use the term fetus, <laughs> I usually try to preface it with the word human. So mm. I think that allows it, because fetus can often be used in a dehumanizing way. So when I'm in a dialogue, like when I dialogue with Destiny or with other people about abortion, I might say the unborn. I know some people like preborn. I just use unborn because it's, it's just more common what I've used. Uh, but if I do use the term fetus or embryo, I just use it as an opportunity to include the the prefix human before it, the the human fetus, the human embryo. So that's what I would do. I I'm with you on that. And you know, at live action, we do use fetus and embryo. Mm -hmm. We talk about how these terms have been used to dehumanize or mm -hmm. depersonalize the preborn. We do say preborn, typically child. Yeah. Um, but that. We do need to take back these terms mm -hmm. because they're almost used like slurs. Right, it's yeah. just a fetus, and it's like a human fetus is a younger than yeah, human right. infant. You know, it's a stage of development, and that's yeah. um, something to celebrate, not to like to denigrate and look down on. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately, they're used as dehumanization, dehumanizing terms, but they are medically accurate terms yeah. for stages of development, like mm -hmm. adolescent. You know, we've obviously yeah. talked about this all the time. So, um, but we do also say baby a lot. <laughs> And child. And I think that's Because those are accurate too. And I would prefer so. to use that. I think it's just hard when you're in a debate or dialogue and someone accuses you of using loaded language. So that's why I try to use language that's helpful, that's the most neutral terms, but still makes my case. Yeah. All right. So let's close out here with you are, I think, the, the leading millennial Catholic apologist. I'm so grateful for your work out there. And please, please, again, check out Trent's work at his Council of Trent uh, yeah. YouTube channel. And you're doing a lot of debates coming up, which are going to be really interesting on theological issues. Yeah. My dear friend, Allie Beth Stuckey, I think you'll be on her podcast, I heard, we're, at we're, some point. We're, work, we're working out <laughs> the details now. I think the goal would be for Allie to moderate a discussion between myself and a Protestant apologist. Okay, so that'll I be I fascinating. I certainly hope that comes about, yeah. That'll be fascinating. Okay, so to close us out, yeah. what is, uh, uh, there's, I mean... I, there's maybe multiple, there are multiple that I can think of immediately, but in your experience, what has been one of the biggest or the biggest, most difficult to answer uh, challenges to the Catholic, mm. you know, the person who's maybe considering Catholicism coming from an evangelical ba uh, background, the strongest argument against Catholicism by an evangelical, and then how mm. would you respond? I think that's that's difficult because what are considered the biggest obstacles are going to be different for, well, pick, for different let's people. Let's pick one that you find, maybe common. personally you found particularly compelling, I, I think or honest, maybe one of the most common. I think, honestly, the, <laughs> the most common by far is, the most common by far when the people who are interested in Catholicism is, is where is that in the Bible? That, that, sure. I, they're all... Where is Catholicism they're, at large They're all the variants of that. They're looking at things like indulgences, the papacy, uh, the different prayers and devotions that Catholics do. And Purgatory. Saying, yeah, and saying, you know, <laughs> if I don't see this explicitly in the Bible, then I don't see how I can be bound to, to believe mm -hmm. that, or demanding all these things be proof texted from Scripture. I think that when people start with that kind of a mindset, it's very difficult for them to wrap their heads around other other Catholic practices. So I guess I would encourage them in a few different ways. Um, number one, I would say, what do you mean by, they'll say, I, I just trust the Bible. Okay, are you saying that what you believe as a Christian cannot contradict the Bible? 
then yeah, I I believe that too. And and I firmly believe, I might even write a book about this, why not another book, that every Catholic doctrine can be shown to not, to not contradict Scripture. Well, I mean, I'll believe it, it's true. Every Catholic doctrine can be shown to not contradict Scripture. Indulgences, the temporary remission, the, sorry, the remission of the temporal punishment of sin that would be purified in mm -hmm. purgatory, that concept is not, con the Bible never says that, that doesn't happen. This was hugely important in my conversion, by the yeah. way, because I went through all of these tough questions. Yeah. Purgatory, Mary, prayer to the saints, yeah. all of these things, the true presence, you know, transubstantiation. Yeah. And, it, and one of those questions as a kind of, at that time, sort of a Bible-believing evangelical was, is this in violation in any way? Right of what I have been taught and what I right. know to be true from mm -hmm. God's Word in the Bible. Yeah, and then you can say, well, no, it doesn't contradict that. There's many assumptions. Protestants mm -hmm. make many assumptions about what the Bible teaches. Like, well, the Bible teaches <laughs> to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. No, that's a misquote mm -hmm. from 2 Corinthians. That's not what it says. Uh, the, you know, Or to say, well, the Bible teaches we're justified by faith alone. Well, no, the term faith alone is only used in James, where it says we are not justified by faith alone. So it doesn't contradict. But then saying, well, okay, even if it doesn't contradict, I'm only going to do something, like, if the Bible doesn't say to pray to saints, I'm not going to pray to the saints. Nobody in the Bible does it, why would I do it? To which then I would ask, well, nobody in the Bible prays to the Holy Spirit. Would you ever pray, you know, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love? Is that a bad prayer? The Bible doesn't record anyone praying to the Holy Spirit to do something directly. There are even Protestants who say you shouldn't pray to Jesus. They would say you should pray to the Father in Jesus' name, because it's very rare in Scripture for a prayer to be addressed directly to Jesus. Except when they say, Rabbani, Rabbani. And they're like, you know, the, I mean, they're praying to Jesus in real life. But then, but the, right, but then the idea... But <laughs> they then had it, that but, beautiful but, but, opportunity but to get I, to talk to the yeah, Lord in I, real life. But a Protestant, though, if, if you and I said, yeah, but Gabriel said to Mary, mm -hmm. Hail Mary, why can't I say Hail Mary? They're going to say, well, 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 Mary was alive at that point. Right, don't pray to the dead, but Jesus is alive. <laughs> the, saint, the saints are alive, <laughs> and too. And the saints are alive, yeah. Exactly. <gasps> but they're not alive here, so that's the argument, of course. They're in heaven, and so... I can ask people to pray for me. On the other, I can use this to ask we people should do to a, pray with me on the other side of the world. We should do another episode at some point where we do devil's advocate. Ah. Because I, I, I mean, I have so many wonderful evangelical friends who yeah. are very smart. I've been there. I've been walked through the arguments, and you kind of yeah. know... That you know, you know yeah. the the concerns. You know, you know the questions. You know the counter arguments. Yeah. But no, I think that's I think that's yeah. And, that and is just, very common what and, you're describing. And then just to point out, all right, then that's why I think it's important to because uh, <laughs> people will say to me, "Prove the Pope from the Bible." Mm. Well, look, I got to go through a lot of steps to do that. First, I need to show you there's no good reason to believe sola scriptura is true, or that the Bible is the only infallible rule of faith. Even knowing what books uh, human human writings are scripture. Well, Scripture doesn't tell us that. So just starting with the prop, I would start with the problem of sola scriptura, and then show, by the way, when we look at Scripture and early history, it seems very clear that the apostles had successors, that the authority of the Church did not die out with the apostles, but was given, was given to their successors, and that the Church continued to be the means by which the deposit of faith was transmitted, not a set of writings that everybody recognized. And then amongst those successors of the apostles, the bishops, uh, even St. Ignatius of Antioch mm -hmm. in the year 107 said to follow the bishop as Jesus Christ mm -hmm. follows the Father. He doesn't tell people to treat the Bible that way. There was no Bible. Uh, there were scriptures, but there wasn't a, a complete understanding of which ones, even among the New Testament, were, you know, that these are the definitive sets of inspired writings. Uh, but you could trust the church, and if you follow the church, you were okay. Uh, I think then amongst those successors, is there anyone that has more authority over the others, like the successor of St. Peter? So it's like knowing to get to the papacy, we got to show Protestantism is wrong about authority, and then show apostolic succession, and then you would get to debates about the successors of the apostles um, to kind of distinguish between orthodoxy and Catholicism. But you can't ask me just to give you one Bible verse on, on this stuff. Well, and that's why I think yeah. your channel is so important, Trent. Mm -hmm and your work because you take the time to go through the steps and explain, yeah. you know, the, the case. Yeah. And this is not just a talking point. This is not just like a social media comment. This is really yeah. taking that time. So where can people find your stuff? I'd recommend they can go to the Council of Trent on YouTube, C-O-U-N-S-E-L. That's on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play. Uh, and they can also check me out, obviously, Catholic Answers. I'm on Catholic Answers Live often. That's at Catholic.com. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so any of those sources. And they can support... 
um, what I do, you can get some of my resources at trenthorn.com. So. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Trent. Great job yesterday. Thanks yeah, for coming on today. Great answers. And check out Trent's stuff. It's fantastic. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining the live stream. Was this fun? Let me know what you think. We're going to do more of this in the future. If you're listening to this on podcast after the fact, always you can send us a message at lila at gtbmedia.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. Ring the notification bell if you're on YouTube because I've heard some of you guys don't get the new episodes when they come out. So make sure you're getting, you're becoming aware of them. Um, I saw another comment here. Lila, you got to take care of yourself. You've been sick all week. It's been three weeks. So I'm so ready to be done with this cough. Thank you for your patience with it. Um, the next interview we're going to do, it's not going to be live. It's going to come out on Tuesday, but I'm going to record it actually in just a few minutes is one that I think a lot of you will really enjoy and it will be really interesting. It's with Erica Commissar on her book, Being There, The Importance of the First Three Years. She is a, a researcher, a therapist who's done intensive, extensive work on the important bond between mother and child, especially in the first three years and the importance of the mother being present in the home with the child. So a lot of questions for working moms, of course, daycare, nannies, we're going to get into all of it. It's going to be awesome. So if you have questions on that too, you can actually put them in the chat here and I, I will t take a look at them for the interview with Erica. It's not going to be live. It'll come out on Tuesday. Again, huge shout out to Trent Horn. He is fantastic. Check out his stuff at Council of Trent on YouTube. And thank you guys so much. We will see you on Tuesday.